Hello everyone, welcome to the class once again. I hope you are all doing good and you are the best of your health. So after learning the concept of viscosity and we have learned certain more concepts in this chapter that is flotation, Archimedes principle, pressure in a fluid. Let's understand the next topic that is Stokes law. Now before starting Stokes law, have you ever observed whenever you release a body in a liquid, you observe that that body is going down with some increasing velocity. And if you have observed that, after a certain time, this velocity stops increasing and the body starts moving with steady velocity. How can you imagine this situation? Imagine a perfectly spherical iron ball and leave it in a pool of water. You will find that it moves in the downward direction. First of all, its velocity will go on increasing. And as it proceeds, a stage will appear, it will reach a stage when its velocity will stop increasing it will reach, reach a steady velocity. Now Sir George Stokes actually studied this motion of a spherical body in a liquid or let's say in a fluid and he gave a certain result. This result was given known as the Stokes law and we are going to learn it now. So let's understand about Stokes law. To make you all understand about Stokes law, I will draw here a figure of a fluid. See, I'm not enclosing this container which is actually carrying the fluid because it will be infinitely very long. Not up to very long, but then to compare to the dimension of the body that is actually going to be dropped in this fluid, this should be very long. So I'm not limiting its length. So I'm that's why I'm making it to be open at both the ends. Now see here, I have to fill this capillary tube or any tube that I have shown you here. Let's say this is filled with a fluid. Observe here, let's say this is a fluid. Now, let's say you have taken a body and you have dropped it inside. You have dropped it inside. So what will happen initially, its velocity goes on increasing. Its velocity increases. And now what will happen? We all know that the surface that will be near to it. See, I'm showing you the surface that is near to it. Let's say you have taken this part. The surface of liquid that will be near to this. This will be re under regular drag due to this spherical body. This is a solid spherical body that we have taken into consideration. The liquid all around it will be under regular drag. So the liquid near to it will also start getting drifted due to this body. Now there will be a frictional drag acting between both the liquid surface and the solid surface. The liquid will start applying a viscous force or let's say a force in the upward direction so that its velocity may not increase up after reaching a final a steady value. Now the velocity that it has attained that is actually the velocity at the steady state. In that case we will be having the viscous force acting on the body or force acting on the body when the body has attained after attaining a steady velocity after attaining a steady velocity let this force be f now what we are talking about let's understand once again the body was dropped in this fluid it moved it moved it moved and at a certain position it attained a velocity let me say this velocity attained is v this is the velocity v that you can clearly see here the force that is acting on this body it was observed that this force is proportional to the velocity which it has attained and then it is also proportional to the coefficient of viscosity of the fluid. So I'm writing the viscous force acting on the body, viscous force acting on the body is proportional to the coefficient of viscosity. This was found to be proportional to the radius of the spherical body that was left to fall freely in the fluid. And it is also proportional to the steady velocity attained. Now we combine all these three, we combine all these three, we will be obtaining F is equal to K 
into eta r v. Now, with certain observations, with some experiments, we found that the value of k is nothing but 6 pi and let us write the all the relevant thing in this way. So, this is the value of the viscous force acting on the body. Now, remember there are certain limitations or there are certain requirements so that this viscous force can act on the body when it is falling freely. Now, this body was left to fall freely in this fluid. As it falls, the liquid which was all around fluid, actually I am using the term liquid but you have to take it as fluid, the fluid is all around it that was exerting a viscous force regularly in the upward direction. Now, this viscous force that we have written at the other end of the board, that viscous force is evaluated after attaining the steady velocity and which velocity I have written here as V. So, 6 pi eta RV is the viscous force that is acting on the body in the steady state condition. Now, remember there are certain points that you need to consider, there are certain requirements so that we can apply Stokes law. First of all, there should be no slipping between the body and the fluid. Certain requirements to apply the equation. First thing, there should be no slipping between the fluid and the body which you have considered. No slipping between the body and fluid. Second thing that you need to understand, first of all, I am not giving you the length of the tube in which the body is made to be drawn. So, compared to the dimension of the body, this length should be very long. So, I am writing the length of the capillary tube or the length of the column of the fluid should be very long. Length of the column of the fluid that we have considered fluid when I am saying so uh, you have to take it as tube, the length of the column of the fluid should be very long. These are the requirements of the Stokes law so that we can mention, so that we can say that Stokes law we can apply here. Now, let us try to derive the force viscous force acting on the body. I have written F is equal to 6 pi eta RV. Can we derive it? Yes, okay, let's try to derive it. I have written directly F is equal to 6 pi eta RV. So let's try to derive derivation of Stokes law. Now see we will use a very basic simple method to derive the formula for Stokes law. And we know that in Stokes law the viscous force acting on the body is actually dependent on radius, velocity and coefficient of viscosity. So what I am going to do, I am going to write this viscous force is dependent on all these three factors that I have just said to some powers. So I am writing here the force is dependent on let us say it is eta to the power a, r to the power b and v to the power c, eta r v all, on all these three factors the force is dependent. So, let us go ahead and try to find out what how this force is dependent on all these three factors. Already we know that it should be a should be equal to b should be equal to c and that all these three should be equal to 1. So, let us try to find out using the concept of dimension. So, using dimensional equation for all these three using dimensional equation. Can I write force as mlt power minus 2? We know that force dimension is this and this should be when I am going to put up the dimension of all these three values, we should have the dimensional equation at the left hand side should be equal to dimensional equation at the right hand side. That is my eta dimension ml minus 1 t power minus 1. If you remember I have told the dimension of coefficient of viscosity in one of the class. So, from there you can recollect power A radius that is length power B 
and velocity that is lt power minus 1 this comes out to be power c so we got this can you see we can simplify this we'll be getting m to the power a l to the power you see minus a plus b plus minus a plus b plus c and t to the power minus a minus c so we got this let me put up here that is ml t power minus 2 very simple derivation this we have compare the powers of mass length and time also water from a tap emerges vertically downwards with an initial speed of 1 meter per second the cross sectional area of tap is 10 to power minus 4 square meter assume that the pressure is constant throughout the stream of water and that the flow is steady let me tell you that this is stream of water need not to get confused and that the flow is steady cross sectional area of stream is 0.15 meter below the tap is cross sectional area of stream 0.15 meter below the tap is a 5 into 10 power minus 4 square meter b 1 into 10 power minus 4 square meter c 5 into 10 to power minus 5 square meter and d 2 into 10 power minus 5 square meter so i believe that you have understood what the question is asking from us there's a tap water is coming out from the tap we need to find out stream of water cross sectional area of stream 0.15 meter below the tap is that is if you see the tap and if you see the running water that is coming out from the tap this is the case let's say this water let's say this is a tap as you can see that and if i show you the exact cross section a bit in an elaborated way let's say this is the tap don't think that i have drawn a very wide mouth of the tap water would be coming out from this and let's say this is the case water is coming out and if you have noticed the water stream tapers at the bottom it will be narrower at the bottom so let's say this area of cross section at the bottom is different and let's say it's a2 the area of cross section at the top it's a1 so this is the water that is coming out through the tap try to understand that i have drawn a stream of water that is coming out from the tap now it says that if you read the question statement water from a tap emerges vertically downwards with an initial speed of one meter per second that is the speed at this point is one meter per second so let me write this as v1 is equal to one meter per second I hope that this would be clear to you all. The cross sectional area of tap is 10 to power minus 4 square meter. That is A1 that we have made here. This is 10 to power minus 4 square meter. Next thing, try to see here. Assume that the pressure is constant throughout the stream of water and that the flow is steady. Cross sectional area of stream 0.15 meter below the tap is. So we need to find out what is the cross sectional area at this point. So by any means, let's say if we take the speed of stream to be V2 here, then what we can do? It says that pressure at every point is equal and that can be taken as to be equal to atmospheric pressure. First of all, you see whatever water droplets coming from this end, if I draw in this way, it's starting with a speed of V1 that is 1 meter per second and it will travel a height of that is 0.15 meter this is the height 0.15 meter so can we comment on this using the concept of v equals to u plus 2 as from there what we can get we will be getting the value of v2 if we use using v equals to u plus sorry v square is equal to u square plus 2 as this is what we can use v square is equal to u square plus 2 as so in this case final velocity will be v2 let's write here v2 whole square is equal to v1 whole square plus twice of gh so we can evaluate the value of v2 so one formula will let us the value of v2 and after this what we can do we can use the equation of continuity we can get 
you can equate a1 v1 equals to a2 v2. So, see here v2 whole square. So, v2 whole square is equal to v1 v1 is 1 whole square plus twice of g that can be taken as 10 and h is given as 0.15 meter. I believe that this should be clear to you all. See that it is given that 0.15 meter below the tap. So, v2 you will get as in this way as it is shown here. So, this will come out to be 1 plus 1.5 into 10. So, this will come out to you see here 2 into 10 20 or you can just take here 1.5 into 3. So, this will come out to be 4 v2 whole square is 4. So, v2 will come out to be 2 meter per second. This is the value of the stream of water at its lowest point. After this, we need to evaluate, we need to evaluate the value of area of cross section at this bottom end. Can we use equation of continuity? I hope that you would have taken note of this and let me rub this part. Let me rub this part and let us go ahead using equation of continuity. Equation of continuity if we use, we will be obtaining or we can write a1 v1 is equal to a2 v2. From here, we need to find the value of a2. a2 will come out to be a2 is equal to a1 to v1 by v2. Equate it, a1 we already we know that is provided to us and a1 is 10 to power minus 4 square meter. 10 to power minus 4 square meter, let us put the unit at the end point, v1 by v2, v1 is 1, v2 is 2, so 1 by 2, this is what here we are going to obtain, so this will be equal to 1 by 2 is 0 0.5, so 0 0.5 into 10 to power minus 4 or we can write 5 into 10 to power minus 5 square meter, 5 into 10 to power minus 5 square meter this is what we are going to obtain in this case this is the value of area 5 into 10 to power minus 5 let us check a option 5 into 10 to power minus 4 incorrect b 5 into 10 to power minus 5 square meter yes sorry it is c option it is c 5 into 10 to power minus 5 b 1 into 10 to power minus 4 incorrect and d 2 into 10 to power minus 5 incorrect I hope that you have got how to do this such kind of question first of all you need to understand what formula you can apply you need to differentiate yourself in your mind that whether you require Bernoulli's theorem or you can use only equation of continuity. You should go ahead and you should think that if you want to use equation of continuity, you should know the speed at this point and that you can only obtain when you have applied the equation of motion and you know the velocity at this point. So that thing will give us the value of velocity or you can even conserve energy, whatever you wish, you can apply as I have told you in this subsequent solution. So, this was a good question, it has been asked in your previous year mains examination. So, I believe that you would be getting to know what kind of questions can come in your examination. Let us go ahead with the next question. Second, a closed compartment containing gas is moving with some acceleration in horizontal direction. Neglect effect of gravity, then the pressure in the compartment is A, same everywhere. B lower in front side, C lower in rear side and D lower in upper side. Let us go ahead and let us check the scenario what is happening. It says that it is a container, there is a gas contained in it. A closed compartment containing gas is moving with some acceleration. Let me show you the scenario. Closed compartment. We have this as a closed compartment. It is moving with some acceleration. There is a gas which is contained in it. So, let me show you this is the gas that is contained in it. Now, it is required to know that how to differentiate pressure at various position in this container. Whether the pressure is same everywhere, whether it is lower in the rear side or lower in the front side or lower in the upper side. So, we need to find out is the pressure same everywhere or it is different at any other point. Now, to do such kind of question, what we can do, we can actually, what you do, take any part. I have taken a small part, let us say the area of cross section of this part is A, its length is given as L. Let us say this is the case. So, there will be gases that would be contained here. 
Now, if I talk about its motion, because this entire gaseous system which is contained within this portion, it is moving with some acceleration, that is what is given. So, if I take pressure at this point as P1 and pressure at this point as P2, can we write net force is equal to mass into acceleration? If the mass of gas contained here is m, so we can write that P1 minus P2 into A, pressure into area, pressure difference into area will give you the net force, is equal to mass into acceleration m into A. Quite simple. Now, here only we can actually comment on the value of difference in pressure, how we can evaluate. Now, see this entire term is positive, m into A is positive. That means P1 minus P2 has to be positive. If P1 minus P2 is positive, that means P1 is greater than P2. So, if I write here, P1 will be greater than P2. That means the pressure at the rear end is more compared to the pressure at the front end. That means pressure will be lower at the front end. So, if you see A same everywhere, no. B lower in the front side, yes. The pressure is lower in the front side. C lower in the rear side, no, it's higher in the rear side. D lower in upper side, no, it's lower only in the front side. I hope that this has made you understand how to understand such kind of situations. And in our regular classes also, we have discussed such cases in derivation portion. And I believe that you all can easily think on your own also how we have approached this problem. Let us go to the next problem of the day, question number 3. There is a circular tube, you can see a circular tube in a vertical plane. Two liquids which do not mix and of densities D1 and D2 are filled in the tube. Each liquid subtends 90 degree angle at center. Radius joining their interface makes an angle alpha with the vertical. You can see that radius joining their interface makes an alpha with the vertical. Ratio D1 by D2 is, that is you have to compare the densities is 1 plus sin alpha upon 1 minus sin alpha, b 1 plus cos alpha upon 1 minus cos alpha, c 1 plus tan alpha upon 1 minus tan alpha and d 1 plus sin alpha upon 1 minus cos alpha. There is a circular tube in a vertical plane. Two liquids do not mix and of densities d1 and d2 are filled in the tube. Each liquid substance 90 degree. Now, let us go ahead and let us do it here. Let me show you the entire scenario. This is the tube and I am drawing a larger cross section for your better and clear understanding. This will entail in better understanding of the thing that will be discussed. This tube has a width so that liquid can be taken to be contained in this. Now, you see here it is given that both make an angle of 90 degree at the center. What does that imply? imply? That means the circular arc of which it will be contained, where it will be contained, that will be same in both the cases and that will be quarter of a circle. That means, now you see here, it is given that if I show you, if I join these points and now you see here, one liquid is contained here. and the other one is contained in this portion. This is what that has been shown. So, if I am showing you here, this is the one liquid and the other liquid is contained here. So, I am drawing the other liquid with different color. Hope that this thing is clear to you all. Now, it is given that alpha is the angle you can see that this is the angle alpha. So, if I draw angle alpha separately, so this will be angle alpha. We need to comment, we need to comment on the ratio d1 by d2 and before that, it is given that its radius is r. Let me show you something more based upon all these things. One more thing, this length, if you see this length, and this length, if we compare, although it shows that both are unequal, but both are equal as per the given scenario in the, in the question part, 
So if I draw this line, understand, this is alpha, this is 90 degree, this will be 90 degree, automatically this will be also alpha. I hope that this will be clear to you all why this is alpha. Next, you can comment on this angle, this will be 90 minus alpha. So I believe that the entire figure which I have drawn, that would be clear to you all. Let me mark some more things in this diagram. So what to do before that, first you take note of this, I will draw some more specification in this diagram, don't worry about it.